Good morning. A quorum being present at the Subcommittee on the National Security and Foreign Affairs hearing entitled GPS, Can We Avoid a Gap in Service, will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that only the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements, and without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that formal written testimony from Dr. Scott Pace of the Space Policy Institute at George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs, as well as formal written testimony from Dr. Bradford Parkinson, the Chief Architect of GPS and the original GPS Program Manager, be accepted for the record. Without objection, so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the subcommittee will be allowed to submit a written statement for the record and without objection, that's so ordered as well. Well, again, good morning. And today, the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs will continue its oversight of the defense procurement with a hearing that focuses on a technology that most Americans find very familiar, GPS or Global Positioning System. The GPS was invented by the United States for the purpose of assisting the military in combat operations, but has now expanded to all manner of industries, from personal transportation assistance to commercial aircraft navigation to emergency medical response. GPS is made technologically possible by a group of satellites known as Constellation, positioned in such a manner that when communicating with receivers on the ground, we can pinpoint a location anywhere in the globe. As an acquisition program, GPS service falls within the clear responsibility of the Department of Defense, most notably the Air Force. However, it affects multitudes of users far beyond the military. Civilian government agencies rely on it, as do commercial industries, personal users, and the international community. Indeed, it is as much a part of the world's infrastructure as it is a critical system for national defense. Unfortunately, that reliance is at risk of being misplaced. This morning's hearing was called in light of the subcommittee's requested general uh, government accountability report entitled Global Positioning System, Significant Challenges in Sustaining and Upgrading Widely Used Capabilities. In this report, GAO documents weaknesses in the procurement of upgrades for GPS satellites, as well as the negative effect that these failings have had on current and future efforts. The current block upgrade of GPS, GPS 2F, has overrun its original estimated cost of $729 million by an additional $870 million. In addition, the block will be completed three years late. This is not a new problem for the Department of Defense procurement. We have another situation where the contractor, given total system responsibility for the development, could not execute the job either on time or on budget. According to the GAO, no major satellite program undertaken in the past decade has met its scheduled goals. It would seem that GPS is no exception. What was billed as an effort to streamline the acquisition process instead resulted in a lack of oversight and control by the Air Force and Department of Defense. This doesn't bode well for the next GPS block upgrade, GPS 3A, which just began in May of last year under an extremely aggressive acquisition schedule. The Air Force has engaged a different company and plans greater oversight for this block. The GPS 3A contract was intended to be reminiscent of the days before acquisition reform, when the government tracked contracts closely rather than letting the companies run free. There's a novel idea. That sounds good, however, like the prede predecessor GPS block and so many other Department of Defense procurements, the contract is a cost plus type contract, meaning the government will pick up the tab no matter how expensive it ends up becoming. This system not only hinders the accountability on behalf of the contractor to the government, but also hinders the accountability of the government to the taxpayer. I look forward to hearing from our Air Force and Department of Defense witnesses today about how the failings of the past will be avoided. Of greater concern, even in cost overruns and delay, is the real possibility of a gap in GPS service. Department of Defense has a formal commitment to users to provide 95 percent availability of service, which has been achieved through a minimum of 24 satellites in the GPS constellation. With the aging of satellites in the GPS constellation, there are serious questions about whether that availability can be maintained. I direct your attention to the monitors on either side of the room. The graphics on the screen depict the probability of maintaining this 24 satellite commitment. The first graphic shows the probability of a 24 satellite constellation falling to roughly 80 percent in the 2011-2012 time frame. The second graphic depicts a scenario where, if the GPS 3 block encounters even just a conservative two-year delay, the probability of maintaining a full service constellation drops precipitously starting on October 2013 possibly going as low as 10 percent by 2018. In light of recent history, I'm troubled if we are wholly relying on the scope, on the hope that the GPS acquisition schedule holds as it stands today. This brings us to a second and equally important set of issues. 
How is the Department of Defense preparing for this potential occurrence, and what impact may there be to users if a gap does occur? The reality is that from an acquisition perspective, we are nearing the 11th hour. The President's fiscal 2010 budget terminates funding for the primary GPS backup system, Loran. That puts a lot of pressure on DOD to ensure that GPS meets all user needs, a precarious position to be in if a gap is looming. What are the Department of Defense and the Air Force doing to prepare users for what could be a shock to the system? Department of Defense and users need a robust dialogue in order to ensure that user requirements are met and funded, users are prepared for any possible re reduction in service, and the GPS industry can be involved in discussions about potential mitigation strategies. GPS is a critical asset in our economy and to our security. It's unfortunate that we may find ourselves in a position of weakness because we've not yet learned to get our procurement house in order. My hope is that today's hearing will provide the opportunity for all parties to come to the table to air and address concerns and to bring public attention to this important matter. Mr. Flake. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we all know, GPS is an important part of uh, important asset to the military and for civilian purposes. The Chairman explained uh, uh, very well the problems that we've had, uh, cost overruns, uh, significant delays um, with the next version of GPS um, or, uh, in terms of the satellite systems. Now, uh, we know that uh, the next generation um, will come and that is slated to be on time at this point. Uh, we want to make sure that the problems that we've had recently don't uh, plague uh, the new system coming up. There are obviously problems with the uh, procurement system that we have at DOD and uh, look forward to the testimony and seeing what we can do better in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Flake. The subcommittee will now receive testimony for the first panel before us today. Ms. Christina Chaplin currently serves as the Director for Acquisition and Sourcing Management at the United States Government Accountability Office, where she has responsibility for GAO assessments of military and civilian space acquisitions. Ms. Chaplin has also led a variety of Department of Defense-wide contracting-related and best practice evaluations for the GAO. Ms. Chaplin holds a BA from Boston University and an MA from Columbia University. Major General William N. McCaslin is the Director of Space Acquisition in the Office of the Undersecretary of the Air Force, where he directs development and purchasing on space and missile programs to Air Force major commands, product centers, and laboratories dealing with acquisition programs. He has served in a wide variety of space research, acquisition, and operation roles within the Air Force and the National Reconnaissance Office. General McCaslin holds a B.S. from the United States Air Force Academy and a Ph.D. from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And Dr. Steve Hybrix currently serves as the Principal Director for C-3 Space and Spectrum in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, where he has oversight responsibility for most of the nation's military space, command and control, communications, navigation warfare, meteorology, oceanography, and spectrum allocation activities. Would you like to take on some more responsibilities? <laughs> Previously, he was assigned to the Air Force Research Laboratory, where he was responsible for selecting and managing many of the nation's highest priority space experiments, as well as directing the Air Force's research portfolio of spacecraft power, structures, and control technologies. Dr. Hybrix uh, holds a Ph.D. from Stanford University. I want to thank all of you for making yourselves available today and sharing your substantial expertise. It's the policy of the subcommittee to swear in uh, witnesses before they testify, so I ask you to please stand and raise your right hands. If there are any persons who will be uh, submitting testimony along with you, please ask them to rise and raise their right hands as well. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. The record will please reflect that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. All of your written testimonies will be submitted on the record. So uh, everything that you have written down and submitted to us will be there. Uh, we allocate about five minutes for people to make an opening comment. You'll see the uh, amber light come on when there's about a minute left, and the red light comes on, and the floor opens, and you drop through if you go to the five minutes. <laughs> All right? But generally, we try to hold off on that drastic thing. We'll let you go a little bit over because uh, we value your testimony. We want to hear what you have to say, uh, but we do want to have a chance to have some questions and answers and get to the second panel as well. So. Uh, Ms. Chaplin, if you'd be kind enough to start. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me today to discuss our work on the global positioning system. We performed this review for your committee in light of the criticality of GPS to the military, the economy, and many, many individual users, as well as challenges that have been facing the acquisition programs. We've issued a comprehensive report which is available on the GAO website. The report covers our findings on the acquisition of the satellites, the ground control equipment, the military user equipment, as well as the larger coordination of GPS. Today I just want to highlight what we believe are the most important takeaways of our work. 
In short, all three acquisition programs have had major issues in development, which have had major consequences for GPS users. The GPS-2F satellite acquisition program, for example, as you mentioned, was delayed three years due to an array of issues, including requirements changes, a loss of expertise in building the GPS satellites on the contractor side, lax program oversight, and technical problems that the program is still dealing with. This, coupled with the aging of satellites in orbit, the decrease in the number of satellites that were planned for the 2F program, and schedule risk going forward with the 3A program present the risk of a capability gap. Military user equipment acquisitions have also been delayed considerably due to funding shifts and diffuse attention. This has also had severe consequences for users. DOD purposely reopened already manufactured satellites 10 years ago to install capability that would lessen the effect of jamming of GPS for military users. But today, because of delays in the production of military user equipment, we may not see that capability be taken advantage of for another 10 years. Lastly, because of developmental delays, ground control equipment for GPS cannot presently support some capabilities of the newer satellites in orbit. With regard to the potential gap in satellite capability, our analysis, as you said, shows that if both the 2F and 3A programs are executed on schedule, there's still just an 80 to 90 percent probability that the GPS constellation will stay above 24 satellites. With a two-year delay, the probability drops to as low as 10 percent. A couple notes about our analysis. One, we largely replicated the methodology employed by the Aerospace Corporation and relied on their reliability parameters. We matched the results of our analysis of what could happen without the delay with the results of aerospace corporations. Two, there are measures available for the Air Force to deal with the gap, such as turning off a secondary payload for periods of time. But this produces other trade-offs that need to be considered. Moreover, such measures may not be able to compensate if there are long delays in schedule. Three, our analysis is based on the commitment of the Air Force to maintain a 24 satellite constellation and many users, civilian and military, have expressed a desire for 30 or more satellites, particularly to assure coverage in mountainous and urban areas. Four, the Air Force insists that it's on a good track to meet the schedule for the 3A program. And we agree that it is and commend the Air Force for taking a number of actions to make the program more executable. However, it's important to remember the program is still in its early phases the Air Force anticipates shaving off three years of what was done for the 2F program, and it's still not clear whether the 2F program has overcome its schedule problems. Also, the program is not merely replicating 2F. It is aiming to build GPS on a much larger satellite bus, increase the power of the military signal by a factor of 10, and add a new signal, all of which could create technical and design difficulties for the contractor. Lastly, as you said, no major space program in recent years has been delivered on time. Some programs that have also tried to adopt better practices for development have still run into schedule delays. As we pointed out in other work, some space programs are facing delays as long as seven years. So in our view, there are reasons to be concerned about the schedule for GPS 3A. Moreover, as mentioned before, even without a delay, there's still up to a 20 percent chance the constellation will fall below 24. Clearly, that alone warrants attention from senior leaders and everyone involved with GPS, which our recommendations are focused on and which the DOD concurred with. Before I conclude, I would like to point out that we also focused on the larger coordination of GPS among civil agencies, the international community, and others. This is a very broad area which was frankly impossible to audit comprehensively in the time that we had. But it was clear through our discussions and analysis of documents that there is confusion on how civilian agencies should get their needs met by GPS and frustration on DOD's part which is focused on keeping the program executable. I look forward to the discussion of today's second panel because it will also shed light on the degree that users are aware of risks facing the program and whether they're in a position to manage those risks. That concludes my statement, and I look forward to talking more about the report. Thank you very much. General. Good morning, Chairman Tierney, Ranking Member.
I ask you to please just pull that microphone a bit closer to you and make sure that it's on. Yes, sir. There we go. Yes, sir. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I'm Major General Neil McCaslin, the Air Force's Director for Space Acquisition of the Pentagon, and it's a distinct privilege to address you on the Air Force's management and execution of the GPS program. I've provided a written statement for the record, so I'll limit my opening remarks. GPS provides accurate location and time information in all weather, day and night worldwide. It's vital to military and civil activities, including mapping, aerial refueling, weapons, search and rescue operations, banking, geode geodetic survey, and agriculture. The Air Force, as the developer, operator, and steward for GPS, is committed to maintaining GPS as the gold standard for positioning, navigation, and timing information. As your committee has, has noticed, uh, and this hearing is, uh, is, is evidence, uh, assured GPS capability is critical to the success for many missions, from humanitarian relief to military operations. The Air Force is committed to continuity of this critical surface. To that end, sustainment of the Constellation is our number one priority. In addition, we continue to make improvements to the Constellation, including new civil signals, more jam-resistant military codes, new receivers, increasing accuracy, and integrity of the service. The foundation for success, both technically and schedule-wise, lies in our mission assurance process. Mission assurance is a disciplined application of management, system engineering, and quality principles over the entire life cycle to ensure mission needs are satisfied. It's a culture we've worked hard to rebuild at the Space and Missile Systems Product Center that permeates the GPS team and is ingrained throughout all its functional disciplines. Simultaneously, senior leadership across the Air Force, Department of Defense, and Transportation have committed to GPS program success. This shared goal enhances capability synchronization, budget advocacy and stability, and provides the support we need to deliver and execute our plan. The Air Force, sir, is committed to maintaining GPS as the premier provider of positioning, navigation, and timing services. We have high confidence plan to sustain and modernize this critical national capability. Thank you for inviting me here today. I'm ready to answer your questions. Doctor. Good morning, Chairman Tierney, Mr. Flake, distinguished members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify before the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs. Can I ask you as well, I'm sorry, if you just pull that somewhat closer to you, that would be helpful. Thank you. I'm sorry. Is that better? Uh, I have also provided a written, written statement for the record, and General McCaslin has gone through um, uh, much of DOD's position, so I'll limit my opening remarks. Uh, my name is Steve Hybrix. I'm here today representing Mr. Grimes, the former Assistant Secretary of Defense for Networks and Information Integration. As stated before, I'm the Principal Director for communi Communications, Command and Control, Space, and Spectrum. GPS does play a major combat support role today in both Operation Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom. Uh, the system plays an ever-increasing role in a wide range of DOD missions, including counterinsurgency operations, force and infrastructure protection, collection of intelligence, and strike of, strike of time critical targets. I appreciate the chance to again highlight the importance of GPS to a wider audience and the importance of keeping funding for GPS across both defense and civil lines stable. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you today. We greatly appreciate your support and I look forward to continued collaboration. Thank you for what I can only term as minimalist testimony. It was uh, both of you and General McFarland. I, I don't want to be overly critical on that, uh, General McFarland, but I, I, I read your testimony and then heard what you had to say, and um, some would term it as happy talk, you know, in the context of what we're doing here. And, and I understand that the, uh, the Air Force is excited about its mission or whatever, but we have some serious difficulties here uh, in issues that I think have to be confronted on that. Let me start. Dr. Heibrich, at least your written testimony did address the two questions that the uh, General uh, Government Accountability Office posed. And so, Ms. Chapel, let me ask you, has Department of Defense, as far as GAO is concerned, responded uh, as you would anticipate and as you would have hoped with respect to the two issues and recommendations that you presented? Um, the Department of Defense concurred with both recommendations. And um, while but we have were they done anything about it? Um, the report just went out, so I don't see what they've done yet. Um, the, in describing their concurrence, they pretty much said the leadership structure that's in place for GPS serves them well. And um, what we're concerned about is that they're 
there's a lot of people that have a hand in the GPS program, and it's not always clear who's really in charge of the program. That gets to be particularly troublesome when it comes to the user equipment. Each military service develops its own user equipment that goes on every kind of weapon system you can think of, and that's where we see a huge delay um, getting that user equipment onto weapon systems. So the military services have their control over that issue. Um, acquisition technology and logistics have control uh, and oversight over the acquisition side of GPS. Uh, the NII office has, um, is designated as the lead office for GPS, and there's also many, many other players involved with GPS. So again, in our view, what we were hoping to see was just strengthened kind of leadership focus on GPS because of the potential capability gaps, because of the risk and acquisition, and because of the criticality of GPS to everybody in the nation. Uh, Dr. Hybricks, are you that person? Are you the one that draws it all together and makes sure that they're coordinating and getting things done in a timely fashion? Uh, that is my role, yes, uh, up at the OSD level. Uh, we have put a single service, the Air Force, in charge of all segments of the GPS program. Uh, this is unlike the way that we handled many of our other space programs where multiple services are involved. So from that perspective, you do have a single uh, entity that's in charge of acquisition and operation of the system. Um, my office at the OSD level is, has been given by the Deputy Secretary of Defense singular responsibility for this program. Uh, that said, we have, to, we have to manage the program within the department's processes. Uh, it's one of many programs and has to get traded off against all the other various department uh, needs. Um, I'd like to address um, the issue of the user equipment delay, if I could. Uh, I think that uh, about four or five years ago, the department, and, and particularly the Air Force, did recognize that there was a risk of a gap if we did not act. And they did or did not recognize? Did. Did. Did recognize that. And it is for that reason uh, that within the resources available to the program that we prioritized the space segment followed by the ground segment upgrades um, higher than the user equipment. That's one reason the user equipment is lagging is because we wanted to prioritize any mitigation or mitigation of a, of a gap in service. So you took from Peter to pay Paul. Basically, you took money out of the end user as, aspect to deal with the, um, the satellite situation. Yeah, I'd argue that it's, it's, uh, it's probably less a, an issue of money than it is just an issue of, of people that understand this technology, that can do this kind of work. There's only so many resources that we can apply to the various uh, things within space that we're trying to execute. And, uh, and within this program and the elements of, of, of our nation that understand this technology, we've prioritized continuity of service. And, and now, if you look at where we're focused today, it's largely on the user equipment because we feel we have a pretty solid plan going forward for the continuity of service issue. All right, well, we're going to get to that in, in a second. But Ms. Chaplin, does that give you any comfort? Um, I know you're familiar with GAO's concerns about the larger acquisition process, and one of right. the things we harp on is investment strategies and prioritizing across the department. In my view, if you're going to put a priority on GPS, you need to have a priority on the user equipment and look beyond the space portfolio for those resources if it's so important to the military. Thank you. And, and I'm curious, how does the Air Force really manage all of the other um, departments and tell them, you know, what needs to be done when? Uh, you know, General, do you have any difficulty with that? I mean, what I hear from the GAO report is that everybody's sort of getting their, their aspect of it ready when it's ready and putting it on whenever they might, and there's no seemingly control over getting them all coordinated and synchronized. What are you doing about that? Yes, sir. Um, let, me, let me elaborate a little bit on that. Um, first of all, the Air Force's role in user equipment is to develop product lines that are available for uh, the other services and any user to integrate them. And, and just as, as um, uh, something to show, I have here uh, engineering models of the uh, next generation M code compatible uh, user equipment that we're going to be fielding uh, to operate with uh, GPS-3 uh, satellites. Now, these are very early engineering models, but it's, uh, and it's from two different vendors, and it's just some illustration that we, we're, we're, we're making technical progress today. Uh, to your broader question about management, it's the Air Force's role 
uh, to develop, uh, productize, and make available for production um, gear like this. Uh, and these are, these are chipsets and uh, sub-assemblies that have all the, uh, the functions of GPS on them, and to make them available for the, uh, the defense industry and the other services as a whole. And, and this is because the, the, you know, the Air Force really shouldn't be in a position of, of building the end item that is fielded into Army mechanized equipment or into ships or into other people's airplanes. Uh, no, but I suspect that somebody, if not the Air Force, then Dr. Hybrick's office, I mean, should be in the business of making sure they get it done in time yes, sir. into certain standards. Yes, sir. You bet. You bet. And the standard setting um, inside the department, uh, the Office of Secretary of Defense uh, sets policy oversight. Uh, the Office of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs sets technical standards for uh, functional integration uh, across this enterprise. And we've been through this in several waves. If you may recall, the original fielding of GPS into the military took these tools of synchronization. Uh, and so this, th there's been two generations of modernization of GPS user equipment since the original fielding. All of them uh, have uh, followed a pattern that, that we've, we've learned from. Um, and it, it's a balance for a program manager, say uh, the manager of um, uh, a, a, an Army uh, mechanized equipment line. Um, you know, it, that, that program manager has got uh, their own set of, of, of schedule and cost constraints and, and, and services to integrate into his weapon system. Uh, so our job in the Air Force is to create an opportunity to, for, for that program manager to have good choices, economical equipment, technical standards uh, that, that, um, uh, so that we can support them. Um, the, the timing and the synchronization of this is, is an issue that uh, um, you know, we, we look to and, and support uh, OSD in their oversight role. Uh, we in the Air Force are accountable for the, uh, for, the, for the integration into Air Force weapon systems, but we also decentralize that so that the program manager of those particular weapon systems are the, the first line of accountability of the integration of a new service like GPS or satellite communication or any other service into their particular program. This is an effort of some complexity and its synchronization, but it's a balance between the specialized nature of a service like GPS and the, 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 the mission function of a particular weapon system that has to integrate services like this. Mr. Flake. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, appreciate the testimony. Major General McCaslin, I never really heard what you thought of the GAO report. Um, did you agree with the findings? Uh, do you concede that there's a problem and an issue here, or, or is everything just hunky-dory? Well, as, as the Department's response um, uh, uh, ranking member, uh, Flake, uh, indicated, we generally agree with it. We offered some, some clarification and, and comments. Um, if, if, if I may, uh, and, and take the lead from your question, um, let me step through a couple of, of reactions uh, to the report. Uh, to start with, with this, uh, this risk of a gap, um, as uh, uh, the GAO indicated, uh, they followed the methodology and the technical assumptions that we use in the Air Force to monitor this. Um, those assumptions were provided to them uh, some time ago, about a year ago, uh, and in that time, some things have changed. Uh, these uh, lifetime assumptions are a bit like actuarial tables with people, except we don't have human history to base them on. We've got a much shorter history in a population. The specific population we base it on is the flying population of GPS 2R satellites. Uh, and in this year, the 2R satellites have continued to live. So the, the models that, that, um, uh, uh, that we base their future forecast have grown a little bit. So just in the year, uh, we, we can look to the same gap, and if we were to recalculate it, uh, it would be only about half the depth that it is today. The second comment that I would make, and the GAO did acknowledge this in, in their report, uh, is that uh, this model is based on a predicted launch rate, and it's based on the full use of all the power on the satellite for all the payloads. So those are two choices that the operators, uh, and, and General James, uh, who will be on panel two, uh, could speak to, the operator will have choices to make. They'll have choices to make about how fast they actually launch the satellites, and they'll have choices to make about the way they spend the power on the satellites. So when we, when we take all of this in, in the whole, 
Uh, we on the supply end have choices to make every budget year with the degree to which we, we program the rate of the build rate and the replenishment of the pipeline. The operator has choices to make for how fast they consume the pipeline and how fast they consume the on-orbit resources, the degree to which they consume the available electrical power. With all of that, we're confident that we've got several, several degrees of margin in preventing a, a gap like uh, has been depicted uh, in, in the GAO's report. So the GAO's report is accurate insofar as those technical assumptions are, are what happens. We think that there are many choices that will allow us the way to, uh, uh, to, to not face those circumstances uh, over the next uh, few years, sir. All right. Uh, Ms. Chaplin, one of the uh, ways to extend the life uh, of these satellites is obviously to cut secondary payload or, or cut power to those, I guess, to extend the life. One of those secondary um, assignments or, 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 or purposes of these satellites is the nuclear detonation detection system. Is that one of the secondary payloads that, that can be jettisoned, if you will, or, or put aside? And if it is, uh, yes, the life of the satellite is extended, but uh, do we have a gap then in some of the secondary purposes, uh, the, the nuclear detonation detection system? Well, our point is you can turn off those um, secondary sources and conserve a lot of power, um, but that needs to be a discussion that needs to take place precisely for what you're saying, that to look at what other gaps you might be facing. Okay and other capabilities. Um, also with regard to predicted launch rates, um, it's important to note that last year we had a lot of issues in launch manifest, a lot of backups, so even what you assume can be a good launch rate may not turn out to be the case. With regard to the assumptions of data being based over a year ago, I would like to note that we held up our report um, a little bit longer so that we could receive data from DOD that w came to us in March 2009, updated all our analyses, and that's what you see reflected in our report. So you're, you're, you stick to the percentages? Uh, yeah, I'm very confident what we have is, is about as recent as we, you know, we could possibly get. I would also comment that these same um, gap scenarios have appeared in other documents, including um, described but not in a chart form in the report that DOD delivered to Congress on the GPS system in December 2008. Um, so the concern about gaps is a long-term one because basically a lot of satellites that are in orbit are aging um, and there's only, you know, you do have measures you can take to conserve power and stretch out the constellation. There have been times before where people have been worried about gaps and the Air Force has managed them quite successfully. But here we are again and I, our point is this is a high risk and we just need a lot of attention and resources on it. Doctor, do you have anything to add to that, uh, particularly with regard to the nuclear uh, uh, detonation detection system? Is that a, uh, one of the choices to, to, uh, to not have that function as a way to extend the uh, satellite? Uh, sure. It, that is one of the choices. Um, I would point out that the, the NDS system, the new debt detection system, uh, does not require 24 packages on orbit. Um, it's a much lower number. The reason we, we launch one on every GPS is just to have a standard satellite configuration so we're not worried about which orbit we're going into. So there's, there's a fair amount of leeway there to turn off payload capability without impacting performance of the system. Um, I also wanted to add that uh, that we're using the term gap, and and that sounds very black or white. Uh, compared to pretty much all of our space capabilities, the GPS constellation degrades, whether it's from 30 to 29 or 24 to 23 or 5 to 4, more gracefully just because of the numbers of satellites. This is kind of like the numbers of sweaters in my teenage daughter's closet, right? The, to go from 24 to 23 sweaters is not, is not like she doesn't have any more sweaters. It may seem terrible to her. Um, so what we're really talking about is a slight chance, and, and our analysis, which is independent of the Air Force's, um, is more in line with General McCaslin's analysis, that we're, we're in more in the 10 to 20 percent chance 
So a, a small chance of going for, for a short period of time from 24 to 23 satellites. It's not as if GPS will turn off, but I point out the original GPS spec was only 21 satellites. The decision to move to 24 in the, in the late 90s was a somewhat arbitrary, I don't want to call it an arbitrary number, but it was, it was sort of an estimate of, of what we could afford versus, versus the cost benefit of building more satellites. We decided we were going to shoot for about 24 satellites. So we shouldn't be sitting here thinking that all the GPS receivers are going to stop working. Uh, what you're going to get is a slight degradation in performance over small portions of the world for small periods of time. And, and relative to, to today, and, and it primarily impacting uh, users in canyons and places like that. Thank you. Thank you. We didn't realize you were under such stress having a teenage daughter, but we'll try to be easy on you now. <laughs> Mr. Foster. Yeah. If you could um, continue on that point. Um, the degradation that you see then has to do with the, the resolution you get or the acquisition time or what? How does it show up when you get fewer and fewer satellites? Um, you will see it, you would see it, I mean, you would see it today if we, if we, today we have, we're flying 30 or 31. Um, if, if you lose one today, which, which is well within our tolerance, you will see the same impact, a slight degradation in accuracy, and possibly for certain users that are in deep canyons, et cetera, you'll have less, less opportunity to get four satellites in view, you know, a slightly smaller opportunity to get four satellites in view and therefore be able to compute a solution. So for certain very specialized users, a slight increase in the acquisition time potentially to get the four satellites in view, and maybe a slight change in the, in the accuracy also over certain spots of the globe uh, for okay. short periods of time. And I understand there's also a European competitor system, Galileo, I think. And do you know what the time scale for that is and what its capabilities are nominally from both a commercial and a military point of view? Uh, there is a, uh, a European satellite system. It is currently a paper system, um, mm -hmm. but there is money allocated to go off and build it. I believe that they are still targeting 2013 or 2014 time frame to be launching satellites. Um, depending on which analysis you believe, that may be very optimistic or it may be accurate. Okay, and the intention is to make a system where, um, where you just have reprogrammable digital receivers that you can listen to either the European or the U.S. system? Will a typical commercial system allow at least be able to work off of either system? We have negotiated an agreement with the European Union so that our signals will be compatible, so that when their satellites launch, it will be possible to build receivers that can accept signals from both systems simultaneously. Uh, potentially, if we're flying... 24 satellites and they're flying 24 satellites, a user would have access to 48 satellites at that point uh, for the civil signal. Uh, we don't have any agreements at the moment for um, relative to their, they, they, don't have, they don't have a military signal, they have a national security signal, um, but there's potential for that there too. Okay, I'd, the next question is for General McClaston. The, um, are, are the two modules that you have here the only modules that will be the standard solution for all earthborne equipment? Uh, th those, those are prototypes of what the Air Force intends to make available as standard engines for the GPS military user equipment. There's a, there's a, there's a commercial industry that has shown us that they will also develop GPS user equipment for commercial applications, uh, and, and some have capitalized uh, military applications as well. So um, we, we uh, will build this product line, uh, make it available with the, the tech documentation. Uh, my own sense is that our American industry will, will, will also uh, develop their own product lines uh, and make those available to, to suppliers as well. Okay. Now, do you have, uh, but so the, from a military point of view, you intend to have one product line and everyone's just going to use it? Or are you just going to say, here's a reference design and then all the different services are going to go and, and come up with modified versions of that? Well, we intend to make, I mean, that's the core of the GPS receiver that you've got in your hands, the, the, um, uh, the radio, the cryptography. Well, I take it this ball grid array that's sort of double sticky taped on here is a, a mechanical prototype here? 
Yes, sir, those are engineering prototypes, and those are pretty early models. I okay. just wanted to illustrate that, that it's, it's moved beyond paper. Um. No, no, it's into plastic. Okay. Do you have working silicon for all of the um, the pieces of you know the actual chips that'll be here? I, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't. Do I didn't, you have working silicon? Do you have integrated circuits that do the job? For, for the sub assemblies that we we do there, for the correlators, the security modules, we do. We haven't we haven't got a a working uh, a prototype. The working prototypes are due uh, uh, at the end of our in the in the end of the uh, FY10 program. Okay. And is there anything in the spaceborne equipment that? that is being held up because of uncertainties in the earthbound equipment? Or no, do you sir, have, not you at have all. a well-defined technical interface there? No, sir, there, not at all. And we've, they're independent design we, we have, problems? We have, well, they, they are dependent, uh, of course, but we've, we've published the, uh, the signal structure specifications. Uh, and as, you know, as the, along the lines of Dr. Hybrick's uh, last comment, we, we work to define that because the, the signal structure uh, its definition. So those have been frozen. Those have been frozen already. The, yes, sir. The interfa okay. So there's no uncertainty that uh, crosses over. Okay. My light's red. Mr. Duncan, you recognize five minutes. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling this hearing. Our our briefing paper, um, our memorandum says uh, the current. Modernization program was projected to cost 729 million with a completion date of 2006. The Air Force has failed to meet cost and scheduling goals for this project. GAO estimates that this project is 870 million over budget, and three years past due. And I remember reading last year a GAO report that said the Pentagon um, uh, had a total of um, 295 billion dollars in cost overruns on just its 72 largest weapon systems and nobody nobody got upset about that apparently you're not supposed to criticize the military in any way today and i think in part it's because the figures are so high that nobody can really comprehend it people did get upset about the uh, 328 thousand dollar photo mission to New York City, maybe they can understand that a little bit better. But now, according to our memorandum, one billion six hundred million has been spent on this program and yet it's still not completed and it's eight hundred and seventy million over budget. General McCaslin, is it, McCaslin, is anybody upset about that or are we just going to gleefully go on and just so that if uh, Chairman Tierney holds a hearing on this a year or two from now, uh, people are just going to come in and tell us it's even more over budget and further behind schedule. I mean, somebody ought to be upset about this. Well, sir, um, I uh, won't dispute uh, being upset. Uh, I am, too, because as a, as a supplier, um, that's resources that I don't have available to meet my operational customers' needs. Uh, so um, I'm inclined to uh, resonate with you. Uh, as the GAO report uh, pointed out, uh, the particular uh, portion of the GPS program that those figures were, uh, were associated with is the GPS 2F satellite program, the, the current production uh, program. Um, and, and the GAO noted that a number of circumstances conspired to, um, uh, to aggravate the business performance of that program. Uh, one of which was the consolidation of the defense industry. Uh, the GPS-2F program was awarded to Rockwell Collins. Uh, as the industry consolidated, Rockwell was, was purchased, its factory oper operations uh, moved up to, um, it integrated with the former Hughes Space and Comm factory in El Segundo uh, under Boeing ownership. Uh, the second dimension that the GAO also noticed, uh, noted in, in her report, um, what was that um, the, the government also chose to um, evolve and modify this program at the same time in response to user demands. We had military and civil uh, requirements that we were trying to meet, uh, additional services for civilian uh, second civil signal, uh, and the beginnings of the evolution of the M-code modernization and the power growth for, for the military. Uh, the third thing that the GAO also noticed in the 2F program was that we, we awarded the 2F program under a, um, uh, a experiment of acquisition streamlining that we now look back and say was, was not successful. Uh, and so the, the, the combination of those uh, have added up to um, cost and schedule growth that uh, um, uh, the GAO has rightly reflected on. Um, the GAO also noted that uh, uh, for every one of those, 
uh, we've taken steps to ensure that those circumstances aren't being repeated on the GPS Block 3 program. Uh, we believe that the industry consolidation is, is stable, uh, that the supplier base is, is healthy, they have a, a business volume that tells us that we can count on doing business with the same people that we signed the contract with. Now, admittedly, that's subject to circumstances beyond defense's control, but it appears to be a, 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 a broadly accepted assumption that the industry is stable. Uh, we've uh, uh, put into practice uh, kind of a back-to-basics approach for government oversight, the use of military standards, uh, and we, we think that that's already showing uh, signs of success. Uh, thirdly, we deliberately well, let me, laid let, out... Let, let me say this. I see my time's about to run out. You know, it, it seems to me that uh, uh, federal bureaucrats, and particularly the Pentagon, can rationalize or justify or excuse, excuse almost anything. It's, it, it seems to me that it ought to be awfully difficult to make excuses for an $870 million cost overrun. Uh, but I suppose that since it's money that's not coming out of anybody's pocket over there at the Pentagon, people don't really care that much. And, and I just think it's terrible. I mean, I, I, I can't describe words adequate to express uh, my feelings about this because I have a feeling that if we come in and have this same hearing a year or two years from now, we're going to hear that there's even more cost overruns. And, and, and if this was happening in the private sector, either Peel would be fired or our company would go out of business. I think it's shameful. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Mr. Duncan and I are going to start our own party on this, uh, on this issue because I, I, I couldn't agree more. And we're going to have a series of, his, uh, of hearings about procurement in the uh, Department of Defense right on throughout this session uh, because it's outrageous. And he's absolutely right. I don't think, General, that circumstances conspire. You know, that's not what happens. People mess up. All right. And I think the Department of Defense, in a big way, uh, has messed up, starting with the idea of whatever they call reform being an absolute joke. I mean, their reform was essentially to take out oversight and management, to take out scheduling and procurement people, to fork over all their responsibilities to things that were inherently government, and turning it over to the private industry as if they were going to be trusted to do everything with no self-interest at all. Uh, I don't know it, who was responsible for that decision. I'd like to know whether anybody's head rolled for it. Do you know of anybody that lost their job for, for uh, changing the system of what well, apparently we have written testimony on the record from the original program manager for the first GPS system that went on time and within budget, uh, and then some genius decided to change that process and to put in what they call reform and take out all of the protections and safeguards for the taxpayer's money and for the end user's ability? So who made that decision, General or, or Doctor, and whose head rolled for it? Are you asking who made the decision to reopen the 2F satellite? Who decided, who decided between the first GPS and the next iteration uh, that they were going to fix something that wasn't broken uh, and drive us to the point where we're now behind schedule and over 100 uh, percent over on a cost? Who went from the system where you had people on oversight, you had government people at the uh, in industries, places watching over this, where you had schedulers who knew what they were doing and how to account for variations, where you had program managers watching it every day to a system where you just gave it to the contractor and have a nice day. I mean, who is responsible for that? Mr. Chairman, the time frame of these decisions were, were in the late 90s, um, and uh, I, I didn't uh, prepare for a historical accounting. Well, it, um, it's, I'm sorry that you didn't, but clearly this hearing was about what yeah. went wrong and what's going right, so maybe you should have. Yeah. But the idea is, who would be? Would it be your level, the person that was in your seat that would make that decision, or doctor? Would it be the person that was in your seat at that time that would be responsible? The, the decision to open up the 2F satellite and add the new civil and military capabilities was made in the late 90s at the White House level. Okay. It was made at the White House level to actually change the whole uh, system of how it was done. Instead of following the, the program aspects of the previous one to go to another thing, they made that at the White House as opposed to the, the Department of Defense? The decision to modernize the GPS system. And yeah, I'm not talking about that, Doctor. Let's, you know what I'm talking about. I know the idea to modernize it. Who made the decision of how they were going to manage it? That's what I want to know. And I doubt very much that that was made at the White House. That was made somewhere in the Department of Defense. And what a question is to you, who in the Department of Defense, at what level and what particular seat 
decided to go from a program that was operating perfectly well to a system that gave it all over to the contractor without any government oversight or any essential government oversight. Who made that decision? If you're asking who made the decision to change how we did space acquisition writ large, because we did change space acquisition and how we did it, not just in this program, but across all the space programs at that time, uh, I would have to take that question for the record. Would you do that, please, and, and let us know? Because essentially, Certainly. we've run into this problem. General, uh, the Government Accountability Office tells us over and over again, uh, these are the issues. The, the, the relaxed oversight, relaxed quality inspections. We're finding we found it with the Coast Guard program, you know, Blue Water. I mean, they gave all the contractors to the same contractor, the one to design, the one to build, the one to oversee. And then when all of that went wrong, they gave them the same contract to the same company to fix it. I mean, we're running into this every time we turn around, and I think part of what's incumbent upon us is to make sure it doesn't continue on. Now, generally, you tell us that you've essentially gone back to basics here, and I hope that's so. Uh, Government Accountability Office reports that th that's what you tell them. There's going to be more oversight of this. You're going to have more quality inspectors on site. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The engagement of uh, support offices like the Defense Contract Management Agency, uh, field offices, uh, the way we engage with the contractors, uh, all of that is, is frankly, um, it, it isn't so much that we forgot the recipe, it's that uh, uh, we consciously chose to, to try it in an uns unsuccessful manner, and we're going back to the methods that, uh, you know, Dr. Parkinson used when he was a colonel. Uh, they've well, I, well. I hope you haven't forgotten the recipe. I mean, again, I think if somebody had something that wasn't broken and they decided to fix it, I'd like to find out who it was and what was motivating it. Uh, you know, I, I doubt that it was sheer stupidity, um, but that might be the case. But if something else was motivating, we'd better find out what happened, investigate it, and, and see where it leads us on that. Uh, the other problem I think that we're going to have, it's replete throughout all of these different procurement programs, uh, is people qualified to do the scheduling and people qualified to do the program managing. Are you having difficulty finding enough people that are qualified to take care of your systems, including this particular system? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that is an issue that, uh, that does concern the Air Force. In fact, um, the Secretary of the Air Force re released a, uh, a plan called the Acquisition Improvement Plan tied to his strategic goal of capturing acquisition excellence. He released that plan just this week. One of those elements is precisely aimed at uh, growing and qualifying and training the acquisition workforce. Uh, so I, I share your concern. Uh, the human capital is the, uh, the heart and soul of good oversight, uh, and, and we're committed to, uh, to the health of that workforce. That's the, that's the career force that I grew up in. Uh, I have a, a, a personal sense of, uh, of commitment uh, to, to growing the next generation of leaders in that role, uh, and I'm really pleased to see my service secretary support that agenda. Uh, are you able to share a copy of that uh, department we, document? We'd love to get that if to you. If you would, yes, we'd appreciate it. Doctor, do you want to add anything to that just before I close out? What is the department doing with respect to what we're told is a shortage of qualified people in the pipeline to do program management and to do scheduling on projects of this nature? Finding good people is always difficult. Uh, Colonel Dave Madden, who I have the highest respect for, who runs the GPS program office out in Los Angeles, uh, is one of the better program managers I believe that I've met. But his, he has one of the most difficult jobs in the U.S. government. It, you manage a very large enterprise. It's a very complex uh, system, and it's difficult to find good people. Um, we have been trying. Uh, I'm not an expert on the personnel systems in the Department of Defense. I'd be happy to find you an expert to bring here or get you any well, I think I think, I think we may do that. I think we may have a hearing with people in there. If this is a problem, as it appears to be, uh, and we've had people come to us of late, I should tell you, and, and explain to us that and no matter what we're talking about in a contract, and Government Accountability Office, I think in almost all the programs on their general report of overruns uh, and schedule uh, problems indicated that that was a real serious issue on that. So I think we will want to have a separate hearing on that. Thank you. Um, Mr. Flake. I don't have any particular questions at this point. I just uh, want to echo what's been said here. Um, it, it seems that, uh, yeah, we're hearing some, as the chairman put it, happy talk. And uh, you, there are ways to explain uh, why these overruns uh, have occurred, both in cost and time. But, uh, um, you know, we want to make sure that the, the lessons are learned. and. Uh, that in the future we're not here, as, as Mr. Duncan said, a year from now, uh, hearing the same thing. 
uh, just more expensive and more timely at that time. So thank you. Chairman Yields, one second. Yes. Yeah, well, one of the questions on that, too, is continuity of program managers. I remember that that was mentioned in the GAO report as well. So uh, what are we doing about the fact that people just continually uh, what, uh, there was a s particular number of people uh, that went through that program, seven different program managers, uh, each of whom, uh, most five of whom served for only one year each. I mean, that can't be healthy for a program this sophisticated and complex. So what are we doing about that? Well, it's, it's uh, sir, it's, uh, I, I believe the, that particular reference uh, was, was looking at the uh, program management inside industry. Uh, so it's an expectation that we hold uh, to our uh, suppliers that uh, that they also field a uh, stable leadership team. Uh, well, this is the 2F program had seven different program managers, the first five of whom served one year each. Right. Right. That's not your right. your colleagues, that's you. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, again, the, the early days of the 2F program was were in the 90s. Uh, today, uh, it's our policy to keep uh, the wing commanders in place, uh, the program managers, uh, Colonel Madden, uh, in place a minimum of three years. Uh, and um, uh, we recognize uh, through the whole acquisition leadership chain that the continuity of acquisition leadership is, is one of the keys. And are you having success holding it for yes, three sir. years? Yes, yeah, Okay. Thank you. Mr. Foster. Um, you have a, do you have an integrated project schedule in place? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. And, and um, could you provide us with a list of the high-level milestones that we can anticipate in the next one or two years? Yes, so sir. So that we can, when you come back a year from now, we can track you against those? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, in terms of the system degradation, do you actually have a good, um, either a modeling or a lot of field experience to really understand this? Um, what's going to happen as the satellites um, stop? Right. I, 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 I feel that the Air Force has really the gold standard in the, in, uh, that's been developed by our um, uh, federally funded research and development center, the Aerospace Corporation. This has been their, um, uh, in f their corporate focus since they were founded in the early 60s. Uh, so they have uh, pioneered and uh, keep the, uh, uh, the technical research on uh, satellite failure modes and effects, actuarial forecasts, um, device physics. Uh, phenomena in the space environment, uh, the science basis for making these kind of runs. So, yes, sir, I, I think it's the best in the you, world. You think it's a well understood degradation process? That's, oh, yes, sir, okay. very much so. That's yield back. Mr. Flake. Let me just finish up for a second. Uh, Dr. Heibrick, um, as far as uh, streamlining the uh, uh, procurement process, are, uh, we know that's a pro been a problem in the past, but is that being taken care of? And, and one other question. I just want to make sure that, uh, that, that Congress isn't part of the problem here. Are there uh, congressionally directed projects or, or contracts that you have to deal with uh, that, that slow the process or complicate the process, uh, given your mandate to make sure that these, these contracts are uh, open to competitive processes? Uh, I'm not from the from the procurement process side uh, of the department, that would be our acquisition technology and logistics. We have a new undersecretary there. Um, he has some strong ideas, I believe, on how we're going to change the, the procurement process to make it more effective. Um, I wouldn't presume to speak for him and the kinds of changes that he wants to make. Um, uh, but again, I could take that for the record or, or bring in somebody from his office to discuss it. Let me just ask Mr. General McCaslin uh, on that second question. Uh, is Congress playing the proper role here? Are we given the, the, uh, you the flexibility and, uh, uh, with which you need to, to carry this out, or, or are we uh, complicating the process by, by directing you perhaps with congressionally directed earmarks or projects that, that make it more difficult to do your job? Well, sir, uh, focusing on the GPS uh, program, um, my, my sense in interaction with the Congress over the past decade has, has been one of a very healthy interaction uh, with the Defense Oversight Committees um, and uh, a, 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 a supportive role, uh, both in terms of, of um, critically examining our plans uh, and in providing the funding that we need to execute the program. Um, but with that entree, I'd, I'd point out that uh, the GPS-3 program is going to enter into uh, a little more complicated nuance. Uh, there's a presidential directive that um, uh, uh, assigns the, the responsibility for budgeting 
uh, new civil capabilities to um, the Department of Transportation. And so the, uh, the synchronization of their budget requests uh, in the Congress with the defense budget request, the preponderance of the money will be defense. Uh, but we've chosen as a matter of national strategy uh, to um, um, uh, program budget and request appropriations from uh, the, uh, the civil, uh, a civil um, um, funding line uh, to add to the military funding line for this uh, national capability. Uh, that's going to be new territory for us, uh, and, and I uh, respectfully uh, suggest that that would be worthy of careful attention. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Chaplin, uh, this is apparently a cost plus contract. Is there a better way to do it? I believe the better way to do it is to focus on not making the mistakes in the past. Fixed price um, for this type of program would be difficult because you're trying to advance technologies and there's a lot of unknowns. When we've tried fixed price arrangements before for space programs, it was done at the time that we were also trying to implement these other kinds of acquisition reforms and it was very poorly implemented and it resulted in almost disastrous consequences. So under the contract scenario that they're in, I would just say they need to exert good oversight over the contractors. They need to make sure the program stays stable. They need to make sure requirements don't change. They need to um, really look at contractor performance and base the award fees on how the contractors performed. I think a lot of things have been done on the 3A program to position the program for success, and I'm hopeful that will be more successful than other space programs in the past. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, do you write into your contracts some protection against uh, industry mergers uh, interrupting the, the course of things? Hmm. Uh, sir, we, we, we don't explicitly um, require them to um, make commitments like that about what they'll do within their companies. We, we make an, a business agreement with them to deliver, um, you know, good services and supplies for a period of time. Um, but then when they don't do it because they're merging or whatever, you just pay them more money. Uh, what can we, I mean, it's a contract. It would seem to me that you can yes. put things in to protect yourself. Yes, we do. You don't necessarily no. say that you're going to restrict them from merging no. and consolidating, no. but you can say that no. you have some say over whether or not it's going to happen, if it's going to impact That's adversely the That's progress right. on your program. Yes, yes, sir, and, and, the, and the tools to protect the, the taxpayer's interest there range from our incentive fee plan, which has uh, an opportunity to earn money if they deliver, uh, and penalties if they don't. Um, we, we ultimately, even on a cost reimbursement contract, uh, reserve the prerogative to decide whether charges are allowable. Uh, and lastly, with respect to the contract type, I'd point out that the GPS 3A program at this stage is in its development cycle, which is appropriate to use a cost reimbursement contract, but we reserve the prerogative to uh, negotiate a different contract class for production articles. For example, the GPS 2F program today um, is, um, uh, has a mix of a cost reimbursement uh, effort for the first satellites to get that production line stable, and then fixed price uh, buys for the, uh, uh, the last uh, uh, eight, I believe. Okay. Will you have your office prepare for us an accounting then of the delays that were caused by, and one of the reasons you cite for this overrun in, uh, of cost and the delay was the mergers and the consolidations. So provide for us an accounting of how many uh, bonuses or fees were not paid uh, when that caused a, a slowdown in an overrun uh, and what other uh, exercises were taken under the contract to protect the taxpayers' rights. Because uh, I think we have a right to know that they weren't getting bonuses and fees and, uh, and other things for taking self-interested consolidations and merges uh, and slowing down the project and running us over costs and at the same time getting rewarded for it. Uh, so if you would do that, I would appreciate it. Yes, sir. I, I certainly recall um, uh, even recently um, uh, very low to zero uh, award fees being paid to the 2F contractor. Uh, as we were struggling to turn that program around. Uh, under I just new appreciate management. you putting that in so we formally see that, if you would. You bet, now, sir. We've got a, a whole host of problems here, with, generally with procurement, not just with the GPS program on that. So I wanted your assurance that you're either dealing with them or going to deal with them. One is starting programs too early uh, before the design is, is where it ought to be or whatever. Are you dealing with that? Uh, yes, sir. I, and, and I think that, you know, the GAO noted in this report that we had put extensive pre competition. Uh, risk reduction activities uh, into the program. Um, 
I, I think it's evidence of, the, of success that we have, um, we had a, a functioning engineering brass board of the entire GPS 3A payload available before we made contract award. It was part of the pre-competitive -com -pre risk reduction activities. Um, we passed a uh, serious uh, and, and thorough scrub by the uh, OSD uh, uh, director of research and engineering who attested to the technological readiness, part of OSD's internal due diligence. So uh, I'm confident that we started this program on a good foot. Okay. Now, you, uh, I, do you cite any contract and program managing weaknesses? Do you think you have any that exist right now, or have you filled all those gaps? Sir, so, so I think at this stage of the program, um, the, the program management strategy is as well tuned as we know how to do it. All right. So you have no problems with technical ex expertise. You have all that you need at your fingertips. We, we, we're uh, adequately resourced for executing okay. the program today, sir. All right. You see no capability gaps in the industrial base? Well, the, 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 the space industrial base um, is, is, of course, the, the people who will actually build this. Right. Uh, I believe the prime industry base is healthy and strong. Um, we, we all have some concern about the secondary suppliers, the, the, the vendors, uh, the people who, who field uh, you know, independent sub-assemblies like gyroscopes and star sensors uh, and, uh, sp and space qualified components. That's an industry that's, uh, that's under some stress uh, and we, we monitor it very carefully. In fact, we have a um, uh, an, an interagency uh, working group uh, spanning all of national security space uh, focused on the health of the space industrial base. We exchange uh, information. We provide a forum for those vendors to, uh, to bring um, uh, correlated problems that they're seeing across the industry to our attention. Uh, and the, the, the DDR&E uh, in, in OSD has a, a certain amount of um, uh, a funding available for support of the industry base. Uh, in my mind, when I look at, at industry, that's the level that has the, the, the risk that concerns me the most, sir. Okay. But you're doing all that you can do about it right now? Uh, yes, sir. I believe, I believe so. What are we doing about uh, protecting against new requirements being added as the project is going on and, and that having an impact on that? Are we shutting it off, just deciding that we're going to have a particular product, that's going to be it for this program, new things come on the next end, right. or what are you doing? Yes, sir. That's, that's, a, that's a very important point because, uh, as the GAO noted, uh, part of what made the, uh, what contributed to the cost growth on the 2F program was the, the folding in of new requirements. We've chosen to, to structure the GPS-3 program in a way to pre-plan those insertions. And what I mean by that is that we have a capability list for the, for the final product version of GPS-3 that that's in, includes a number of low-risk features and includes some high-risk features. We chose to take on the most important and lower-risk features first in 3A and to size the spacecraft, its power, its chassis size, the launch size, to provide the room to grow for the higher risk features. We will make separate decisions as the requirements for those higher risk functions, further power growth, additional signals, uh, additional security uh, features, uh, and, and we'll conduct a detailed uh, assessment of alternatives and risk assessment and decide what package of those are ready for including in a distinct uh, second block or potentially a third block. Now, this isn't a win all around. Uh, our military users had to reconcile that they would be patient enough to, to wait longer than they might have. The assurance we gave them is that we had a higher confidence of delivering what we had committed to uh, in exchange for that. And that appears to be a bargain that uh, is holding water. Uh, and and we, we welcome um, your support of that too, sir. Well, it would seem to be at some point somebody, the doctor or you or somebody, has the authority to say, you know what, enough. You know, we, we planned this particular program to do those things. We thought it was what we wanted. Uh, if something's going to be added on that's going to bring this way over cost or way behind schedule, they'll have to wait for the next bus. That, that, and who has that authority? Is it you, doctor? Uh, that authority rests with the joint staff requirements process. Um, I would say when I mentioned earlier that four or five years ago when we recognized that we potentially had a constellation sustainment issue, the Air Force came forward with a plan. Originally there was no 3A, B, C, there was just a 3, and we were going to build the whole thing uh, right up front. And they came up with a plan where the 3A is really just a low-risk satellite to make sure that we have something to keep the constellation going. And then we have plans to insert the various capabilities into the later block. Okay. 
And then lastly, I, I look at the General Accountability, Government Accountability Office and I see they, they have identified nine practices associated with effective scheduling estimating. Of those nine, one was met in this uh, 3F, 3A uh, schedule, uh, one was not met, and seven were partially met. Uh, are you focused on that and are you going to bring that up to all best practices? Uh, sir, I'd, I'd like to take that for the record because um, as little time as I've had to review this report, I wasn't able to, to actually right. itemize what those practices were, but I'd be pleased to go uh, and answer that for the record if we you appreciate would allow that. me, sir. Thank you. Mr. Blake, anything else? No. I want to thank all of you for your testimony. This is helpful to us and I think helpful to our next panel to give them an idea of, uh, of what's going on and we'll be anxious to hear their remarks as well. Uh, and I would appreciate it if you uh, have an opportunity to submit those things that you promised for the record at your earliest convenience. So thank you all very much. Thanks. And now we'll uh, take a little pause as we set the second panel up uh, and maybe come back in five minutes. Thank you. <laughs>